Hello everyone, this is John Smith. I'm in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, and welcome to Tuesday evening Bible study. It's uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time in this part of the world, and uh, it's, it's record-breaking uh, cold temperatures today. Uh, very cold in Saskatchewan, but that's not deterring us, and uh, we're going to uh, resume with the online Bible study. We completed a series two weeks ago and, uh, and took a week's break. And so in the interim, I've been preparing for, and tonight uh, we're beginning a series on the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. I've actually entitled the series, Strive First for the Kingdom. And uh, lesson one, uh, tonight is called the Messiah and the message the Messiah and the message so I invite you to join us tonight and every Tuesday evening or whenever it actually works for you to access this and uh, and go through this series with us we're going to be studying from the Gospels mostly tracking through the Gospel of Matthew but there's a lot of parallels and supplementary things in uh, Matthew, uh, excuse me, in Mark, Luke, and also John that we'll look at as well. Plus there's uh, some other supporting scriptures uh, in the rest of the New Testament and we'll even look in the Old Testament sometimes. But we're focusing on the kingdom of heaven uh, as it is presented to us in the Gospels. And the theme for the series comes from Matthew 6 and verse 33, where Jesus says, But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. Well, if Jesus says to strive first for his kingdom, for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then, uh, then that's what we should do. And uh, we should pay attention to everything then that Jesus says about that and uh, make sure that that's what we're doing. So I invite you to join me on the, in this series. Uh, there's a lot of good material in the Gospels, of course. But uh, besides doing in-depth Bible study, and I certainly encourage you to have your Bible on hand for, for all of this, uh, I also want this to be very applicational, and I think it will be, and I think you'll see by the end of this first lesson why or how this can be so very applicational to us and, uh, and why it's important. So let's dive in. Uh, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, I'm going to begin by looking at the first two verses of chapter 3. The first two chap uh, verses of Matthew Three. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The ministry of John the Baptist, who preceded, of course, Christ, that, uh, that centered around a call to repentance based upon the imminent arrival of the kingdom of heaven. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, or is at hand. Uh, it's here. Okay, it's, not, it's no longer distant. It's no longer far away. It's no longer something you're looking forward to. It's now, uh, it's now right in front of you. It's near. It's at hand. So that's what he's announce, announcing. Now you're going to notice that uh, the, king, the, the terminology kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are used pretty much interchangeably uh, throughout the Gospels. Uh, there are some who try and make a uh, distinction between them, but I, I really don't think there is in the way it's used. Um, there are some teachings where the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven might be referring to something like uh, life after death or you know the reward uh, of heaven after life on earth and so sometimes that's referred to as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God 
you know, and, and, and uh, reaching that kingdom. But really the terminology used throughout the Gospels about the kingdom that, over which Jesus is presently the king and over which he was the king when he came to this earth as the king of kings uh, and was born a king, that kingdom, that's the kingdom uh, that's being referred to in what we're exploring. The, king, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Jesus, or just simply the kingdom. Uh, whenever we use that terminology, that's what we're talking about. And that's what uh, John the Baptist was proclaiming. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Then we read verse 3. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So Matthew, the narrator, is telling us that John the Baptist is the one that was prophesied about, the one that was to come and prepare the way of the Lord. So this is what the ministry of John the Baptist is about is preparing the way for Jesus and and again his proclaimed message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand that's that's what the preparation is okay let's read verses 4 through 10 and see what that looked like now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the preparation that John makes for the Lord is uh, that he begins with calling people to confess and repent of their sins. And he calls for people to be baptized as visible, as a visible expression of their repentance from sin. So he, he's, he's uh, in the region of, of the Jordan River and uh, people come and uh, his message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And as they respond and they, and in order to express their confession and their repentance, he baptizes them in the Jordan River. He immerses them. That's what the word baptism literally means. And so, you know, that works in a river like the Jordan River. He baptizes them. But then in verses 11 and 12, things uh, kind of go to the next level. I baptize you with water for repentance, but... One who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his weed into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So as John is baptizing people you know they're embracing his call to repentance and coming for baptism he's also preparing them for the one who is coming after him okay the one who he's not even worthy to carry his sandals John says and when he comes he will baptize with the real transforming agent which is the Holy Spirit and he'll also baptize with fire which is the agent of judgment so he will baptize with the whole he will baptize you people with the holy spirit and with fire 
and and the if you read the passage carefully what he's what he's saying is <laughs> is that some of you will be baptized with the holy spirit and those of you who are not will be baptized with fire that's you will come under judgment you you need to be baptized in the holy spirit by the one who is coming after me jesus christ you need to be baptized um, in the holy spirit that's not happening with the baptism of john uh, it is a baptism of repentance but but there'll there'll be a baptism that that jesus brings that the one who's coming after john the one who's more powerful brings that will be a baptism of the Holy Spirit. They need that baptism, uh, but he's also bringing a baptism of fire. So he's going to gather the wheat into his barns, into his granary. That's Those are the ones that are baptized with the Holy Spirit. But then there's going to be the chaff, the ones who, who, who don't come and are not gathered uh, together and uh, as wheat. Uh, into the granary, they're going to be burned with fire. And so that's the baptism with fire that's being talked about. Okay, uh, now let's read verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, well, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Wow, this is an amazing uh, revelation. This is now Jesus stepping onto the scene. J John the Baptist has been preparing the way and preparing people for the arrival of Jesus, the beginning of, of, of Jesus' ministry. Well, now Jesus is ready to begin and he arrives on the scene. And uh, uh, so uh, John's ministry has reached a climax. And, uh, and, and so Jesus is asking to be baptized. Jesus' baptism is punctuated with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the affirmation of the Heavenly Father. Okay, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, th that's what I'm calling it, is the is the dove the it was a visible manifestation of god uh, the holy spirit descending and alighting upon jesus so we have the holy spirit we also have the the father the voice the the audible manifestation of god was the father the heavenly father saying this is my son in whom i am well pleased and, of course, the third manifestation of God is Jesus himself, who is standing on the bank of the Jordan River in human flesh, uh, dripping wet from the waters of the Jordan River. He's, he's just been baptized. And, uh, and so we have that manifestation of God. This is a very profound manifestation of God because we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all a part of this scene. Very powerful, very significant. Not only that, but the baptism of Jesus, as we see it here, is also the precedent-setting scene for the Christian practice of baptism that would proceed, would be initiated, and would proceed uh, from the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 as the expression of faith, confession, and repentance in response to the gospel invitation. You might remember that in Acts chapter 2 the people asked when Peter preached what we often call the first gospel sermon, um, the people asked, you know, men and brothers, what, what must we do? 
And Peter's reply in verse 38 is this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so baptism, following the really the example of Jesus, was then to be the Christian response, the believer's response, to the gospel invitation. When someone came to believe, then they were called to be baptized, and they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus was anointed, you know, the descending and alighting on him of the Holy Spirit, the, the Christian as well receives the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, when they are baptized. Very significant. So, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom, has not only drawn near, it has arrived now in the person of Jesus, the Messiah. He's now actually showed up and identified himself, really for the first time. Uh, to the public, and uh, and he did it by coming to be baptized by John, who was uh, the one who was preparing the way. And so, uh, in the next chapter of Matthew, chapter 4, uh, before Jesus actually launches into his active ministry, he, uh, he goes for a fast in the wilderness for 40 days, uh, in preparation and then starting in verse 12 of chapter 4 then he begins his public ministry and so let, let's go to that you know John John's ministry the the summary message uh, that Matthew reports to us of John's ministry is John proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven is near well listen to this about Jesus uh, we're going to read 12 to 17, those verses from Matthew 4. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, oh, listen to this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Well, isn't that interesting? The same summary statement describing the theme of what Jesus is proclaiming as he launches into his ministry, is that it's the same summary statement that we had for John the Baptist's uh, proclamation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And actually this, this is, continues to be uh, the focus of his message. Okay, this is the focus of his message. Uh, there were healings. There were other miraculous working of signs that uh, accompanied Jesus' preaching and teaching. But the core message of the kingdom uh, remained uh, the same. Listen to these uh, other verses. And I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. If you need to pause and turn to each one, go ahead and do that. Later in chapter 4, verse 23, this is in Matthew, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So he's going through Galilee, do, doing these miraculous signs, healings, but he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. We find the same thing if we look at the parallels in, in uh, Mark and Luke. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. 
Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And then in Luke chapter 4, verses 42 through 44, and this is interesting because in these Matthew and Mark passages, it's been about his ministry in Galilee, but of course we know he also did significant ministry in Judea, where the city of Jerusalem is. Well, that's what this is about, Luke 4, beginning in verse 42. At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him. And when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. So now he's, he's, he's going to be proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea, not just Galilee. And, and what is the message? It's what is the good news? It's the good news of the kingdom, of the kingdom of God. The message is about the kingdom. But, you know, interestingly, the essence is clearly about Jesus, the Messiah, bursting upon the scene and filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God and working miracles and, and showing people who he is. He is the Christ, the Messiah. That's, that's what the message of the kingdom of heaven is. When it says the kingdom of heaven is near, it means the king is here. Jesus is here. <clears throat> so there are two realities for application here that, that I want to, to put forward to you. And, uh, and, and that's, that's where, where my focus is going to be on applying this to my, to my Christian faith and to my life. As we go through this whole series, um, that, that's why I want to do this series on the kingdom, on strive first for the kingdom, is... Uh, is because of these two realities, and here they are. First of all, the good news of the kingdom is that my king has arrived. I have a king. That's the good news of the kingdom. Uh, in December, I did a series of uh, lessons on Sunday mornings for the, the church here in Weyburn on the kingship of Jesus, the king has arrived. My King, Jesus, my King. And of course, being uh, in the month of December, we did talk about his birth, uh, but really the focus was on Jesus is my King. And what does that mean for my life? Believers and worshipers of God, which is what I am, and I, and I hope you are as well, we're being called into submission to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. There is no kingdom without the King. So the, this study of the kingdom is really about uh, Jesus Christ and how to be in submission to him because he is the King and we are subjects of his. Okay, whenever I spend time thinking about the kingdom of God and how that involves me, or whenever I am teaching about it to others, which of course I'm doing at the moment, the primary focus must be on Jesus the King. You know, it's important to learn and teach about the, I don't know, the operational uh, structure of the church and, you know, other things. Uh, but this must never be done at the exclusion of the persona of Jesus the mission of Jesus the King, the character, the example, the teachings of Jesus, the proper worship to Jesus, who is the King. All of these things need to be shaped by that awareness and that, re that realization, that acceptance and that submission to Jesus, who is my King. 
So that's going to be my impetus, first of all, uh, in this uh, study series, is I need to learn as much as I can about what it means that Jesus is my king. What does that mean for me? How, how, am, I, how am I supposed to live because of that? What kind of relationship do I have with God? What kind of relationship do I have with Jesus if he is my king? Okay, the, the second reality for application is that I am called to citizenship in a kingdom. Citizenship in a kingdom. Uh, not merely, I'm not merely called to an individual discipleship to a master, Jesus. I mean, I am, that, I am called to discipleship <laughs> under Jesus, the master. That, that's right. Uh, and very personally called to discipleship under him, but not merely as an individual disciple. I am called into a kingdom of disciples who are following the master, Jesus. Do, do you understand the difference between just being an individual, one-on-one -on -one disciple following a master and what it is to be part of a kingdom of disciples, fellow citizens in a kingdom who are in submission to a king, reigning over his kingdom. See, there's, there's a difference there. There's a difference there. I'm a part of something more than just myself, more than just myself and Jesus. It's his kingdom and Jesus that I am a part of. And, uh, and so I need to learn as much as I can about that. You know, there, there is a real sense of personal salvation and servanthood into which I enter through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it is inseparably coupled with incorporation into a fellowship with all other disciples. You know, when you read through the rest of the, the New Testament, uh, the book of Acts, which, you know, has the ministry, uh, uh, tracks a lot of the ministry of Peter and John and, and Paul. And then when you go through all the letters that come after that, starting with Romans and going all the way to Revelation, which has the seven le letters to the seven churches, um, the, the epistles from the apostles, Paul, Peter, and uh, John, all talk about this kingdom aspect. Uh, they emphasize things like congregation. They emphasize things like the family of God, you know, your brothers and sisters in the household of God, who is your heavenly father. Uh, the body of Christ over which he is head, and you are all members of that body. You see, that's a, that's a kingdom concept. It's a group concept. It's a fellowship concept. Um, the, the army of God, we're part of a spiritual army, soldiers of Christ. Not individual mercen mercenaries sent on, you know, um, solo missions. We are the army uh, of, of the Lord in Christ Jesus, his spiritual army. We are the temple. Now, there is the teaching that our bodies, each of us individually, are a body in which the Holy Spirit resides, and that makes us a temple of the Holy Spirit. But very clearly, Paul, and, uh, and then later Peter, also write, about the fact that we are, we are collectively, corporately, the body, or sorry, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the building built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, who Peter calls the, the living stone, and then we become living stones built on that foundation, and together, built together, we are the temple in which God resides. That's a kingdom 
concept. And there's a, an aspect to that 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 I can that you and I can only accomplish by being in this fellowship of the kingdom. We can't accomplish some things as an individual disciple of Jesus by ourselves. In order to fulfill the mission of the the body of Christ, the family of God, the army, the temple, the congregation, the only way to fulfill all of that that's taught uh, by the apostles and began with Jesus uh, is by being in this fellowship of the kingdom. That's, uh, that's interesting to me. And so, uh, and that, that's, to me, that's very clear. And so one of the things I'm going to watch for, the other reality I'm going to watch for in, in this study series is uh, what I'm, what's being asked of me and what's being asked of us as brothers and sisters, as fellow citizens in the kingdom. How, what is that to look like? What is it to look like? What does it look like for me to belong in this kingdom of fellowship with other disciples, okay? So those are the two realities. Jesus is my king, and what does that mean? And I'm in this, I'm a citizen in this kingdom, this fellowship of all the other disciples. What, what does that mean? And what's that supposed to look like? And how am I, how are you and I, going to achieve that together. So that's what I think the importance of this study is. And, uh, you know, all the things taught in the, in the epistles and in the book of Acts, they begin with what John the Baptist proclaimed and with what Jesus proclaimed throughout his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Please join us every Tuesday evening uh, as we progress through this study series, uh, strive first for the kingdom. And remember that God's grace is for you in 2022.